this is a really very, very interesting meeting. Uh, looking forward to, to the rest of it. So in terms of disclosure, I'm a molecular biologist. Um, I've run a research program for over 20 years, first focusing on the molecular biology of cancer and then uh, senescence. Uh, we worked a little bit on telomeres. Uh, that's how I know the organizers so well. And more, more recently, we've really kind of shifted to the biology of aging, uh, specifically looking at chromatin and epigenetics. So I was, my title had something to do with P16 and cell cycle, and I'm going to say a few things about that. But I think the really overarching question that we're all struggling with is, why do we grow old? Can we make sense out of this process? And can we do anything about it? And we've already heard a lot about the remarkable extension of human lifespan, how this has been achieved in a relatively short time and has mostly been driven by uh, environmental intervention. So when you go and see your doctor and he's prescribing something to you, I don't know, Lipitor, Metformin, you know, something that's obviously going to be good to you, what he really should be telling you is, the good news and the bad news. And the bad news is that uh, there's a very high likelihood that your late years will be filled with disease and suffering. And I think this is something that we in the field uh, are really struggling with and want to do something about. So now I'm going to get reductionist, which is my usual mode of operation, and we're going to skip right down to cells. And we, in fact, truly believe, I think there is a lot of very good evidence that cells and the molecular processes that happen in them are highly relevant to the aging of organisms. When you look at cells, there are really two very different ways in which they age. There's chronological aging, which is fairly obvious. It's a cell that is not dividing, that is simply aging over time. And this is really an issue or a problem of macromolecular homeostasis. Obviously, DNA, proteins, lipids, they get damaged, they wear out, they have to be replaced. But it's the same cell, it's sitting there, and it's aging chronologically. You probably know that the great majority of cells in our bodies, in fact, fall in this category, and therefore, in terms of understanding aging, this is a very important concept. Replicative aging is something completely different and Jerry has spoken extensively about this. It's the counting of cell divisions. So I really don't need to say anything more about that, why it has evolved, et cetera. I thought I would flash the original Hayflick experiment, which is kind of you know the experiment that launched the 1,000 ships uh, maybe like 50 years ago. And what you see here is the proliferation of human fibroblasts in cell culture and invariably they reach this plateau that we call replicative senescence, which is not death. They survive for very long periods of time. They're metabolically active. I think this will probably be very comforting to the physicists in the room that this is the most reproducible experiment in biology that I know of. Everybody all over the world that has ever done this experiment has gotten this result. Uh, I don't know of many other experiments like that. So we had a lot of, uh, we did a lot of work in the cell cycle, and I'm going to review this very briefly. Uh, the question was, okay, if telomeres are the re replicometer, how does the replicometer signal to the cell cycle? I'm not going to say very much about the cell cycle, though that is in my uh, title. It's a, obviously a huge regulatory network, a signaling network that has many inputs and many outputs and has a core, I think of it as a, as a clock that actually drives the progression of the cell from one phase to another. In replicative senescence, I'm only showing the part that regulates uh, the entry into G1 phase. So this is how resting cells enter into the cell cycle. And uh, as it turns out, 
some of these proteins, such as the retinoblastoma protein and these things called P21 and also P16, are kind of the nuts and bolts of this machine. And the reason why I'm not going to spend any time on this is that this is actually part of the signaling network that we know a lot about. So you don't have to worry, worry about it. <laughs> you just have to look it up, basically. Um, what we did early on is genetic experiments, genetic epistasis experiments in cell culture trying to order the events between short telomeres and the ultimate cell cycle arrest that Hayflick described. Uh, by epistasis, I mean these are experiments that genetically determine the hierarchy of the players in this pathway. And this is the core pathway that we derived, and this has actually stood up fairly well over time. Retinoblastoma is here at the bottom. It's an interesting protein. Uh, biochemically, it's, um, I mean, it's not a kinase, it's not a transcription factor. It's some kind of a big protein that interacts with a lot of other proteins. And it was initially identified as regulating the activity of certain transcription factors that were necessary for cell division. But it also interacts with many complexes that modify chromatin and is also responsible for initiating and maintaining highly compacted forms of chromatin. P21 and P16 are these little proteins that influence the activity of the cell cycle kinases, the CDKs. They both inhibit the activity of CDKs. P53 is a transcription factor that upregulates P21, okay? So you can see that we have uh, this linear pathway that goes from telomeres through P53 and ultimately to R RB. Now what happens um, between telomeres and P53? Again, I'm going to summarize this very quickly. Jerry has already mentioned that a telomere that is critically short is perceived by the cell essentially as a DNA damage signal. So in fact, that is what is between telomeres and P53. An assay that we and others have developed uh, that can actually look at the presence of uh, double strand breaks at telomeres, and this is what is shown here. The red dots are the telomeres, and the green dots is an immunofluorescent signal against the protein that is associated with DNA damage and, and double, double strand break. So basically what this is telling you is this, this double strand break is just somewhere out there, and these double strand breaks are very close or at telomeres. And this was very, very important in the field because it really demonstrated in a very profound way the connection between telomeres and DNA damage. And you can see that these objects that we call TIFFs increase as cells approach senescence, and if you immortalize the cells with telomerase, they go away. So we've been so far talking about telomere shortening as uh, the trigger of this pathway and the trigger of senescence, and that is certainly true, but it very quickly became evident that there are many other types of stress that can also uh, plug into this pathway and give you this terminal arrest that resembles in many, if not all ways, uh, replicative senescence. So really the issue is there is more to replicative senescence than telomeres, but this is a story that has evolved uh, over years and has kind of gone back and forth, and in fact, I don't think is quite finished. There's some very recent data that would indicate that in fact telomeres may be somewhat analogous to the canary in the gold gold mine, and in fact are the uh, most persistent forms of chronic DNA damage. There's some recent work actually from uh, one of my former postdocs showing that oncogenic stress, which was previously thought to be connected with collapse of replication forks, ultimately resolves itself into telomeric damage, which then is probably responsible for the long-term maintenance of, of senescence. So this is clearly a debate that is ongoing, and the central theme here is DNA damage, and particularly chronic and persistent DNA damage that the cell has a hard time resolving. 
Now, P16 is a very odd character, and we've done a lot of work with this uh, protein, and it has remained relatively elusive, but I think it shows in a very nice way that not everything is necessarily connected with DNA damage. So I'm showing you here a culture of fibroblasts, and these brown cells express high levels of P16. We've stained them immunohistochemically. You can see that the frequency of P16 positive cells increases as cells approach senescence. However, if you immortalize cells, you, um, you know, fix the telomeres, you eliminate the chronic DNA damage, but you do not eliminate the P16 positive cells, which are spontaneously generated in a continuous fashion. And uh, we've done a lot of work on this, and I have to admit that in the end, we still don't really have any clear-cut answers. Uh, what we see is expression of P21 and P16 are not co-regulated. They both can inhibit proliferation. As I already told you, these cells are generated all the time. Uh, you can upregulate P16 in manner that seems to be telomere and P53 independent. And I wouldn't really be telling you all this about something that's relatively obscure, but recently P16 has emerged as an excellent marker of tissue and organismal aging. And there are, in fact, experiments in the mouse where P16 positive cells that accumulate either as a function of some stress or as a function of aging. If these cells are cleared by genetic means, this has very clear beneficial events. So I think we definitely have to uh, understand more about how P16 is regulated. So this is kind of the revised pathway. Now, please keep in mind that what I'm showing you here is a very pathway-centric view, and this is really a network that I'm not showing because all of these characters have many inputs and outputs uh, that are not shown on this slide. So the telomere shortening or the telom telomere signaling pathway is well understood. It is processed by kinases that mediate DNA damage responses, activate P53, the guardian of the genome, which then upregulates this cell cycle regulatory protein that ultimately causes uh, cell cycle arrest. We believe that P16 is on the branch, although there are connections. BMI1 is a member of a polycomb family of chromatin regulators. So actually, the primary way in which P16 is regulated is through uh, chromatin and epigenetic changes. So what we set out a while ago is to look at the occurrence of cellular senescence in intact organisms, not just in cell culture. And we really wanted to ask the question, it's kind of like the magnitude of the problem question. How many senescent cells you can actually see in any given tissue or any given age or condition? And in the first pass, we used our old friend, the TIF assay, and this has been published. And indeed, we were able to show that the frequency of uh, these TIF positive cells increases with, with aging. This was done in primate skin, but there's now data from additional labs, including mice and a variety of tissues. Uh, this is a rather extreme example, uh, maybe because skin is exposed to a lot of environmental insults. If you look at internal organs, you see an age-associated increase that is more linear and reaches values of between 5 to 10 percent, uh, depending on the, on the tissue. We then try to develop additional markers, and one of them that I found particularly compelling is the so-called senescence-associated heterochromatin foci, which were discovered around 2003 at Cold Spring Harbor. And actually, if you're looking here right in this panel, what you're looking at is nuclei, and they've been stained with a stain, a DNA stain, which is DAPI. So these are fluorescent, this is a fluorescent readout. And what immediately is apparent is that the chromatin has rearranged itself such that there are locally 
very high concentrations of DNA. Okay, if you look at a normal nucleus, the DAPI staining is very diffuse and covers the whole area, and then all of a sudden you get these uh, spots popping up, and uh, they actually co-localize with markers of heterochromatin using additional assays. So I'm not going to tell you much about the various adventures that we've had with this assay. In the end, we actually failed to develop this into a robust assay that can be used in tissues because the appearance of these physical structures, these, these local regions of heterochromatin, is not very uh, consistent, let's put it this way, okay? However, if you look at the overall content of proteins that are associated with heterochromatin in the nucleus, this definitely increases with replicative senescence, and it also increases with aging in a variety of tissues. So really the, the take-home message was, well, you know, you can't see the spots, but you can obtain evidence, molecular evidence, that the level of heterochromatin globally increases. So once we knew that, we asked the question, well, okay, fine, it goes up, but exactly where does it go up? And what I'm showing you here is a lot of stuff which is actually very simple. This is high throughput sequencing, looking at relative uh, opening or closing of chromatin. So just to give you a scale, we're looking about 15 megabases of uh, chromosome 16, okay? And this assay that we're using is called a FAIR assay. It's actually not chromatin immunoprecipitation. It's a physical assay that measures, okay, if you're going to hold me to five minutes, then this is going to be <laughs> very truncated. Um, so what this measures is the open structure of chromatin and uh, chromosomes are actually divided into these large regions that are very gene rich and very gene poor, okay? So these gene deserts are typically highly heterochromatic. This is a heterochromatic mark, and what you can see that in early passage cells, you see a very dynamic uh, signal where you see a lot of signal over the gene rich regions because the genes are active and you're seeing a very flat signal in the gene poor region. If you look at senescent cells, you can see a remarkable smoothening, okay? So what is really happening is that you're getting less signal in the euchromatic regions and more signal in the heterochromatic region. And if you do uh, kind of like chromatin painting, this is now a sliding window across the whole chromosome. Uh, this is kind of a very nice visual way of looking at this smoothening. We know by other criteria that uh, heterochromatin is breaking down in certain regions. For example, centromeres, which are the major uh, regions of constitutive heterochromatin, become very distended and opened. And if you use electron microscopy, you can actually see loss of heterochromatin, which stains dark next to the nuclear envelope where most of the heterochromatin in the cell is partitioned to. So you may ask yourself, well, who really cares about this? These are gene poor regions. And so I have to introduce you to transposable elements which are very abundant in human genomes, in all genomes actually. Uh, something like half of our genomes is comprised of retrotransposable elements which can be broken down into several classes or families. The only element that is active in our genome is, be well, believed to be active in our genome is the line one element, which actually encodes a reverse transcriptase that can catalyze its movement. And indeed what we saw is that these elements were uh, losing their heterochromatic nature and we assume as a result of that we're being expressed into RNA and actually using a copy number assay for genomic DNA we could increase, we could show increased DNA copy number. So these elements are actually transposing in the genome. So the summary is that heterochromatic marks and proteins increase 
the number and magnitude of open genes decreases. I didn't show you that. The retrotransposable elements become more open. They are expressed and then they transpose. So if I could have a few more minutes, I'm going to tell you at what happens in tissues. And we can go through this very quickly because the answer is pretty much the same thing, okay? Chromatin becomes more nuclease resistant, which means compact. Total mRNA pools decline, less gene activity. And I'm not going to show you the transcription. The retrotransposable elements become uh, pretty well transcribed. Uh, interestingly, caloric restriction opposes this. And if you, we look at actual frank transposition using the quantitative copy number assay, we can see uh, new transpositions. Now, one thing I like to point out is that we're looking at two tissues here, liver and also skeletal muscle, and skeletal muscle is predominantly a post-mitotic tissue. So all of a sudden, we're now switching from replicative senescence to chronological aging, okay? I'm not saying that the muscle cells are senescent. In fact, we don't see any conventional markers of cellular senescence, such as TIFFs or other signaling proteins, yet these chromatin changes, these widespread chromatin changes and the consequent activation of transposable elements seems to uh, <clears throat> hold up extremely well. This is found in cancer. If we look at line one elements in human prostate cancer, we can see increased activity, we can see increased transposition, and in fact, we can cluster uh, according to disease severity where uh, a more advanced stage of disease is correlated with more line one transposition. The last thing I'd like to show you, and I think maybe the physicists will like this, is a new method uh, called chromosome confirmation capture where we look at long-range interactions of chromatin. Uh, this is the work pioneered by Job Decker. You can read his uh, papers on this, which are very elegant. But basically, the large-scale organization and interactions of chromatin can be partitioned into you know, these large compartments, which are 10 megabases or so, and then these smaller uh, so-called topologically associated domain. So anything that falls off the diagonal is a long-term interaction. This is basically a scatter plot of one chromosome. So what we find in senescent cells is a decrease in long-range interaction. So if you look at quiescent cells, you see the long-range interactions. This happens to be chromosome 17, and you lose that in senescence. If you uh, look at it at slightly, less. so again here, you have proliferating and quiescent cells. This is a very rich pattern of long-range interaction, so you see both enriched and unenriched regions, okay? And if you look at senescent cells, again, you see this remarkable smoothening, and now we're focusing into 20 megabases of chromosome 1 uh, to look at this in more detail. So to conclude, um, I I think I told you a little story here about long-range structural changes in chromatin, how this affects transposable elements, which are genomic parasites, for all practical reasons, in our genomes. Uh, their transcription can affect neighboring genes. The RNAs and the proteins they encode can activate antiviral responses. And the activation ultimately leads to transposition, which, as we know, is highly mutagenic. We're currently doing experiments to inhibit uh, these pathways with uh, reverse transcriptase in, in inhibitors. So thank you very, very much. Great. Uh, questions? I think what you just said is that you think the memory of senescence, where the information is stored that a cell is senescent, is not just in telomeres, but in other places. And I, th I heard two things that are on the table. One is transposable elements in the, in the um, 
chromosome, okay, and the other is some structural memory in the chromatin. Did I hear correctly? Yes. Is there anything else? <laughs> I'm sure there is. I think what I would add to that is that, first of all, the organization, the architectural organization of the nucleus is really just becoming apparent very, very recently. And it's really remarkable how this is, you know, like a fundamental feature that is conserved across many cell types, okay? So to see something like that breaking down with age, I think that is an important finding, okay? Uh, the other point that I would like to bring out is this relationship between the retrotransposable elements and their host, okay? You can really look at this kind of as a host-parasite relationship, and I think this has very important implications from an evolutionary point of view. Okay. Let's make sure I've got the story straight, though, because this is so confusing to me. You say that shortened telomeres do not cause these things. They happen on their own, and they're a separate memory mechanism. I think from short telomeres can cause these things, and in the senescent cells that we are looking at, I think almost certainly it is the short telomeres and the ensuing widespread DNA damage that happens that is triggering these events. However, in tissue such as skeletal muscle, it is highly unlikely that the shortened telomeres are causing this, so we have to look at some other forms of stress or molecular damage that is going to set these in motion. Have you looked at brain? We have looked at brain, and there's a little bit of a disagreement because at first pass we didn't see a lot of activity there, but another group has looked at brain and sees a lot of activity. So I think ultimately there will be activity in the brain. The one thing that is absolutely remarkable is cancer. I mean, we've done a lot of computational work. There's a lot of cancer data out there to be mined. And, <clears throat> you know, computationally, this is a real nightmare because the way the high throughput sequencing pipelines are configured is that the first thing that the algorithms do is they throw out all tags that map to more than one place in the genome. So they're throwing out all the transposable elements. So we have developed pipelines where we actually go back, we recover those reads, and then we classify them in various ways. And that was some of the prostate, and what I was showing you was RNA-seq on prostate cancer. The L1 activity in different forms of cancer is really quite remarkable, and other groups are finding this too. So I think th this will be, you know, um, a new mechanism of genetic instability in, in, in cancer. So, so I want to just maybe continue Bob's question because I want to also make sure I understand. So the, the claim at the end was that even that if we go to some, let's say the brain, but even the muscles, whatever, and you compare, so these are cells, both of which have stopped dividing at some point a long time ago. Nonetheless, there is a memory in the large-scale genomic organization, the chromatin structure related to transposons maybe, that you can see the difference between cells that have stopped dividing that are young and cells that are just now chronologically aged yes, from there. absolutely. And that's the, that was the claim. Absolutely. So what you really basically see is you see a reorganization of the chromatin where you see, you know, losses. So let me just rephrase this. It seems that the euchromatic regions get more compact, which yeah. interferes with gene expression, and the heterochromatic regions become more open. And this gives you this overall smoothening, right. as I call it. Yeah, but that was as characteristic of just what you called uh, you know, the homeostatic breakdown, chronological aging, as it was Correct. in traditional replicative. Correct. Okay. Correct. Can I just put Correct. a just short follow-up here? <clears throat> when you're looking at this sort of uh, structural data, when I say you lose the long-range correlation on chromatin, how, and you're measuring on many cells, how do you know that sort of uh, average of all cells, or you have some cells going worse and it's just heterogeneity that you're measuring on the data of many cells? So what we are looking at right now, the data that I showed you, is an, is an average over many cells, okay? We do believe that there are going to be cell-to-cell -cell differences, 
And what we're doing right now is single cell high throughput sequencing to look at mobilization of transposable elements, okay? That is particularly a difficult issue because these, ele these transpositions for the most part are private. They occur in one cell, okay? And so to be able to really demonstrate that a new suite of insertional events has happened, you have to focus on a single cell. That work right now we're doing in Drosophila because the, sequ the genome is smaller, but we definitely see you know, private insertions in somatic cells at the single cell level. And I'd like to add the breaking of senescence and the retrotransposition at the single cell level also uh, feeds into the element of how cells uh, will develop resistance under selection pressures. So it's uh, interesting how uh, those two worlds are, are interconnected. Uh, let's give John a uh, round of applause.